Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to start diving into this is kind of talking about your all's technology and what you've created here. I think that was, you had mentioned at the very end right there. And this is kind of the joke that I had with Ryan when he first showed me these things. I said, what are these like bourbon bouillon cubes? I was like, how are we supposed to make our whiskey change with this? And so kind of talk a little bit about, try to explain to our listeners really like what they look like and what it's doing and everything like that too. Yeah. So, so there's kind of like, Hey Cody, why don't you give him a little history of Interstave 2 to kick that off? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good idea, Lee. I kind of jumped over that. Thank you. So basically Interstave started in 1979 with a guy named Bob Rogers and basically American winemakers didn't want or couldn't oftentimes afford French wine barrels. So what they would do is they would do very creative things to their current stock of French barrel inventory. And uh, Bob Rogers started shaving the inside of barrels to expose new areas of the barrel wood that hasn't been penetrated and soaked by the wine. Of course, you know, increasing the overall extractable molecule count and allowing the wine to penetrate deeper and deeper into the barrel. So that was kind of the original way. Obviously, you can only shave a barrel so many times. So there was kind of an inherent shelf life on that process. Also, you're going in deeper and deeper into a barrel that's been toasted from the outside typically. So you're getting more raw wood characteristics and, and, you know, just a different menu of extractable oak molecules, whether it's vanillins or methyl guaiacols and things like that. We can, we could talk all day about that, but people love, people love the science geekiness. It's so feel really free fun to, stuff. Feel free yeah. to drop a few uh, long words in there that would kill somebody in a scrabble <laughs> game. You know, you know, it's just a big deal. You know, it's just a, it's a new range. So if you're trying to make a consistent wine product, you know, shaving your barrel is not a good idea. Let's put it that way. You know, you want a, a, a newer barrel that's toasted in the same way from the same species of oak and all that. So basically Bob Rogers recognized that quickly and started going through the bung popping the barrel head off and putting brand new staves in and just really reimagining the way that we saw the barrel use and oak impact. So that grew, it started kind of in the shadows. Winemakers were very cagey about talking about their use of these products. They still are these days a little bit, but basically Interstave helped blaze the trail for oak cooperage companies to then use more of their barrel waste as they created these very specific dimensions for barrels. And then, you know, develop a host of barrel alternative products. And then of course, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years later now, Interstave's always been a leader of that kind of reimagining the oak. And, you know, we went from barrel inserts, bungs through the head to tank inserts, infusion bags, cubes, blocks, two inch by two inch by whatever millimeter or or inch you want. Five sixteenths is a typical width and thickness for us. And then, of course, you know, long format staves from 118 inches down to 39 inches, which is typically our our kind of fan pack usual. Uh, that's one of our biggest selling products. And so basically the point is, is that we want to be able to allow you to use whatever vessel you want and introduce oak and oxygen at precise dosage rates so that you can get an achievable sensory outcome. So whether it's a concrete egg or an old Fudra from the beer industry that doesn't really impact any flavor anymore, or a stainless steel tank, or even a barrel, we want to have a product that works for you. So, so that's kind of our oak, you know, we source all of our French and American oak from the central Missouri and central France. We have a team in France that obviously goes out and auctions a portion of the forest off for our demand. So it's really, really great for, for many, many years. Our company has been able to work with the same team that has these rigorous standards of sourcing protocol so that they can say, okay, we're going to get X amount of trees for you and then basically mill them to then send them to our yard in Carneros. That's where we season all of our oak. So, you know, seasoning is a very important process. It's where wood tannin can, can start to break down and you start to not get so much astringency and really nice texture building attributes from it. So that's why a lot of people like to, in the wine industry, especially, minimum 24 months aging. Whereas, you know, some bourbon barrels, they'll go six, sometimes 12 months, sometimes more. ISC is doing some interesting things, but we really like to to mess around with that seasoning because that's a really big part that's often forgotten about from the casual whiskey drinker, wine drinker. We have some of our inventory that we're, we're messing around with that's, you know, five, six years aged. We're really excited about that. You know, the wood tan breaks down. Obviously you lose some of those extractable molecules that are, that are at the surface of the wood, but with that kind of negative, that perceived negative, you also get a lot of really 
great texture building attributes. So we found a lot of cool success with kind of our longer seasoned wood to be more texture building and less kind of oak impact, you know, the, those vanillins, those caramels, those vanillins and furfurals that kind of dominate those, those typical oak profiles. This is a little bit more subtle, which is really fun. So anyway, we could have a whole segment on on seasoning protocols, but that just kind of gives you a, a glimpse and a window into the the cool stuff that we're able to do because we control the product from sourcing to seasoning, and then it moves to our next step, which is toasting. And we are convection toast house by trade. That's that's our historically our bread and butter. Convection toasting versus fire toasting is an interesting conversation. Fire toasting, obviously. You get a lot more of that smokiness and those uh, those rich, complex flavors, but you also you have a lot of variability. It's not as uniform. Whereas with convection toasting, you're toasting at very specific temperatures for very specific amounts of times, and you can get a very replicable product. And that's one of the biggest things that our customers have come to appreciate about us over the course of 20, 30 years of doing business with us. Some of our customers, you know, they have gotten a consistent product from beginning to end. And that's very important for us as well. We do fire toasting now as well. Uh, so that's something that we're really excited to adapt to the, to the whiskey world specifically, you know, from the char level, obviously you have to have a, a solution for that. And combining that with the different convection and fire toasting abilities that we have is really fun. So, so that's kind of the toasting piece of the equation. And then of course we mill and package from there based on consumer demand and what format makes the most sense for their products. So you're like a cooperage without making the barrel, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. 